Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation, part of our Agilent Cell Analysis Global Conference. My name is Ned Jastrom. I'm a product manager for new platforms at Agilent and will be your host for this presentation. I hope you've been enjoying our previous speakers to gain a better understanding about our myriad of approaches for analyzing cellular function and measuring what matters most to these cell types. Throughout the earlier presentations, you've witnessed the connection between immune cell metabolic programs with cell state and cell fate, while later in the day, you'll have the opportunity to discover novel approaches for measuring immune cell killing and enabling 3D live cell imaging applications. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. David Farrick, Associate Vice President in Agilent's Cell Analysis Division uh, as our presenter for today. Uh, David began his career as a University of California professor, then entrepreneur, and currently industry executive focused on life sciences tools, drug discovery, and diagnostics, specifically in the areas of immunology and cancer. He has commercialized many life science products into new emerging markets based on nascent technologies and advanced several drug screening programs from target identification to preclinical testing. He's authored over 150 peer-reviewed publications and has 13 patents along with several book chapters. Dr. Farrick received his PhD in microbiology and immunology from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. His talk will showcase new concepts and strategies to target cancer through an understanding of the immune response He'll discuss purpose-built applications that enable real-time measure of immune cell function, fate, and fitness. David has been leading our efforts, resulting in a combinatorial cell analysis tool bench, which provides the capability to measure, engineer, and control immune cell function, thus enabling translational researchers and de drug developers to achieve the necessary level of therapeutic potency and safety. But before I hand it over to David, a couple of housekeeping notes. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the talk. And to help us to get to as many of your questions as possible, we encourage you to type in your question during the presentation. David's passion for driving innovation in science is contagious and an inspiration to all of us within the Cell Analysis Division and for me personally. With that, I'll hand over the presentation to you, David. Thank you so much, Ned. I really appreciate that. Uh coming from inside the tent, that's uh, quite um, uh, a pleasant, I uh, appreciate that. So um, uh, as Ned said, we hope that everybody's enjoying their day. And what I'm going to attempt to do here is take a lot of the topics that uh, have been addressed by many of the speakers today and try to pull them together with some of the newest thinking and ideas and how uh, our tool set is helping enable and uh, you as investigators uh, to make that progress. I know that there's not a person listening to this presentation, including my mother, that doesn't appreciate uh, the third wave of uh, therapeutic modalities, what is being roughly referred to as cell and gene therapy. Uh, first being small molecules, followed by biologics, which are predominated by monoclonal antibodies, and now cell and gene therapy, which is a big part of immuno-oncology now. It's really leading the way in that third wave. And I think it's really important to look at some, some real uh, numbers to really understand how fundamentally it's changing how we target disease with this newest modality. Um, right now, cell and gene therapies in development are projected to surpass monoclonal antibodies, which is now a current leader uh, in a couple of years, to give you an idea of just how impactful this is. And of course, that had there had to be a tremendous amount of basic research preceding that in order to enable uh, such a jump uh, in this new modality. And in fact, uh, as you can see now, if you look at the number of INDs that are being submitted to the FDA, Look at the jump uh, in 2019 versus 18, and this is just year to date. So we're looking at a, a fundamental shift in the way that we're approaching uh, how we target disease by going after uh, the immune system in addition to targeting liabilities of the pathogenic process itself. And why is that? What has caused this the fundamental um, uh, shift or pivot uh, in the life sciences approaches that stem from research all the way to the clinic. 
And that is because of the unbelievable curative nature that has been demonstrated in such an early stage of these new types of modalities. Uh, and, and that has really um, caused a number of us at all stages of the, the chain from research to the clinic uh, to begin to adopt and include, um, not to necessarily transition solely to, but to really enhance our approaches and what we're capable of doing. What we at Agilent started four years ago, what we recognized is things are becoming very cell-centric, especially in cell-based therapies, and that the tools we need require us to dive even deeper into the biology than we had previously done. So we really believe that in addition to all the tools we have now, we need to go beyond endpoint into kinetic measures. We need to follow the biology longer. And if you're gonna do that, you need to have label-free, non-perturbing ways of manipulating the cells to look at more relevant uh, uh, biological um, conditions. When we do this, we will have more predictive live cell assays to do things like develop standards for manufacturing cells. And it's just not for therapeutic purposes. It's also for disease modeling, which runs across the entire life sciences. And because of the information we'll be generating by taking a deeper dive, the digital tools to contextualize this information. That's what we're focused on. And hopefully you will see that in the various uh, tools and various new concepts that I'll allude to in my presentation. So we last year, uh, provided our inaugural set of what we've referred to as purpose-built solutions for targeting the immune system with these four instruments. They obviously are applicable in many indications, but we've been working very hard on solutions and protocols that can specifically address uh, questions in the immuno-oncology space. And these are the four that I will uh, limit my discussion uh, and review for today. The top two are our label-free, real-time cell analysis platforms that give you that kinetic information, um, what is believed to be in a more relevant setting where you can follow the biology and you can interrogate it in real time. Below are fairly recognizable technologies in flow cytometry uh, and gene editing, but we believe that we've made some great innovation and have some, some additional value to offer you uh, a particular customers in terms of these capabilities. So let's start with the Excelligence real-time cell analysis platform, which is based on an impedance uh, measurement uh, technology. Uh, it's a very straightforward and quite simple workflow that is incredibly sensitive. So in the case, in this example, um, we have an electrical field that is caused by electrodes, these kind of yellow dots, that runs across the bottom of the plates. And that allows um, whatever cells uh, actually bind and sit on the plate to impede that field. And we can get tremendous amounts of information regarding their size, their morphology, their motility, the proliferation, uh, cytotoxicity activation, a, a number of key uh, biological features. So in this particular example, we're gonna put tumor cells to do a cytotoxicity assay. We believe this technology is one of the best and most specific and sensitive ways to do this type of assay. So we start by putting our tumor cells on the plate, let them grow for a day or so. This uh, entire setup exists in the incubator, so you can run multi-day experiments, which is one of the powerful components of it. And then after we get our tumor cells going, uh, we will add our T cells. Uh, the T cells, because they float above the uh, tumor cells, do not interfere uh, with that electrical field, and therefore you have an extremely specific uh, readout of the tumor cell uh, death and um, cytotoxicity. So you can see here that as the cells grow, the cell index increases due to the impedance increase. After we add some effector cells, in this case, NK cells, if they're capable of killing the tumor cells, you will see a decrease. And that sensitivity, look at the effector target ratios, are much more physiologic. Other technologies, you have to use much higher 2 to 1, 10 to 1 types of effector target ratios that are not physiologic. Here you can go very, very low. So here's a recent publication from uh, Nabil Ahmed's group uh, showing uh, uh, here the uh, uh, publication of a, a dual targeting approach uh, to cancer where they used uh, both a, a HER2 uh, and an IL-13 receptor alpha-2 uh, targeting vector for the uh, CAR T cell, this chimeric antigen receptor. And uh, what they were looking for is to get a sense of the relative efficacy in terms of potency of these various different constructs. 
And as you can see here, running this assay over several days, that um, when you first, in the first day, we're only looking at tumor cells. And you can see as they grow, they increase in their cell index. At about 24 hours, we add the various different uh, CAR T cell and controls. And if they're capable of targeting the tumors and effectively killing them, you will see that impedance drop. And you can see that we can uh, rank order in a very sensitive way the various different uh, constructs that they were uh, testing in this particular scenario. However, what's very equally uh, informative is the next slide, which is unpublished data that was done several months previous to the published work where um, the, the Nabil Ahmed's group was testing various strategies, different co-receptors, different very tweaks to the construct to enhance immunoreactivity in these CAR T cells in an optimal way. Uh, and you can see here, when you look at the earlier work, when you're trying to figure out and optimize which strategy might work most effectively, you can see in the orange and pink, two constructs at a very low ratio of one to 10 were very effective in the early days. But you see here around day three or four that the tumor starts to grow back. And these are very key events that we often miss in other types of assays. And we know one of the great challenges of uh, immunotherapy is not just getting the immune cells to effectively uh, uh, um, address the pathogenic process, but actually to persist, because we now know that the tumor, the microenvironment, and many factors can limit the effectiveness of the immune response. Uh, and so here's a very great way of being able to identify these. And what's really interesting uh, to keep on building on this story is just last year, uh, a new version of the Excelligence system, this impedance system came out that now has three channels of fluorescence. And this now adds uh, a whole new dimension of additional measurement modality that can provide so much cellular uh, context to the, in this case, the cytotoxicity data to keep this story going. Well, how can this benefit? What, what more value can this bring to these sets of experiments? Well, if you remember, we noticed that these two constructs here in the earlier optimization work um, gave a very similar type of effect on the tumor cell in terms of cytotoxicity, and then they both kind of departed here. And what you can see by imaging the tumor cells is the spatial resolution in addition to the temporal context of this kinetic assay. And what they learned, I, I can't show a movie here, but the movie is, is, is jaw-dropping, is that actually as the uh, cars uh, target the tumors, they form this foci, and there are actually tumors that are resisting for an inter, uh, uh, for uh, an intermediate period of time. You can actually see them growing and essentially resisting the cytoplastic effect at different levels. And then when they start, the tumor starts to overcome, you can see how spatially that occurs. And it's different between these two very similar um, uh, constructs in terms of cytotoxicity, but you can really tease it apart with that spatial context. So this is the extra additional qualitative information that can really help uh, understand what's going on mechanistically to design a more optimal approach. So let's move on now to uh, Seahorse XF Analyzer. This is another label-free kinetic assay that can be run on cells. Uh, this one is measuring essentially metabolic energetics in living cells, and this is fundamentally changed how we think about applying metabolism to biology. It's been a wonderful experience to see how this field has grown. And quite frankly, at a, a very high level, measuring metabolism is the actual working end. That's the physical way that a cell goes about proliferating or dividing. And so it's a very direct measure. We believe it's, it's, it's the new way to measure biology or one of the new ways to do that. So what, what, is, what is it actually measuring? For those in the audience that may be unfamiliar, it measures the two quintessential pathways uh, in energy production. On the left in blue is mitochondrial respiration, and on the right in red is anaerobic glycolysis. These two pathways together are measured in real time, meaning you get a rate. You know how active they are on a per minute basis. And, and so this essentially is responsible for generating all the energy that a cell produces to meet its demands, as well as, as well as flowing carbons for biosynthetic purposes. And equally important that we're beginning to appreciate much better is redox homeostasis, which is critical. And redox can be the simple difference between a physiologic and a non-physiologic state. What we've learned in the last five years specifically 
is the ratio of the contributions of these two dominant pathways actually form a very unique ratio that seems to be qualitatively relevant to support certain phenotypes that I will talk about, and has therefore added tremendous uh, uh, usefulness in terms of not only understanding how uh, an, uh, a particular cell can meet its demands and how it functions, but by altering the metabolic programs, we now have understood that we can change the biological outcomes. And that has dramatically opened this field up into the arena of translational and interventional medicine. The field of immunometabolism effectively started around, or the modern era, I should say, the modern era effectively started around 2009 with a couple of seminal papers, one of which I'm showing here by Erica Pierce, where she showed this very simple but very um, insightful discrimination in terms of metabolic programming, the bioenergetic ratio of aerobic to glycolytic processes that relates to very specific um, cell types and their function. Effector cells, which are highly proliferative, that are also differentiating into fully effective cells by producing antibodies or cytokines or direct to killing uh, infected cells, have a very high anabolic uh, need. And so they not only use aerobic, but very significantly increase uh, glycolytic function, as you can see here on the left-hand side. In contrast, memory cells, which start off with a lower demand uh, and have to be extremely stable and very long-lived, they can last for 20, 30 years, uh, take a uh, more aerobic strategy to support their needs. And it actually um, enables them to be much more easily triggered and provide a much more robust uh, second response to the pathogen. So this very simple dichotomy set up uh, uh, the notion that different um, bioenergetic um, um, uh, programs or poise will support different types of functional attributes that may be important, not only for understanding, but intervening in disease. And how, how did this proof of concept get going? Well, very shortly after Erica's paper, Madhu Sukumar and Rick Nastifo's lab asked the question, well, if I only alter metabolic energetic pathway, making a cell more aerobic or more glycolytic, could that on its own affect the outcome of an immune response. And he did this in a very classic transfer model where we transfer educated T cells from one animal to another. So we presume we're only transferring that single factor and we see how protective those animals are to the antigen they've been trained to. In this case, it's a melanoma tumor. And so by increasing aerobic um, activity, he did this by using 2-deoxyglucose. So this is a way to inhibit glycolysis. So on the left-hand side, ECARs are measure of glycolysis. You can see after a three-day treatment with low doses of 2-deoxyglucose, the CD8 cells from these animals are dramatically reduced in glycolysis. If you take the ratio of the aerobic rate over the glycolytic rate, you can see that as their glycolysis decreases, their overall aerobic nature has increased. If we now transfer these and challenge these mice, you can see that by simply making the cells more aerobic, the, the animals were more protected. He also did the reverse experiment where he made the cells more glycolytic and got increased degree of killing uh, in these uh, CD8 T cells. So this was the first concept that altering metabolic programs could actually alter those outcomes. If we shift forward a few years to the Carl June work, we can see that various different immune um, modulators such as the co-receptors, which we now appreciate how fundamentally they're important for both turning on and off immune cells at the appropriate time, and showing that actually these co-receptors actually will, in this particular paper, will actually induce various different metabolic poise. So the 41BB TCR zeta, which is the canonical, if you will, CAR19 um, uh, a T cell that was the one that is now uh, being used to treat patients uh, for blood tumors worked very well uh, in blood tumors, but didn't work well as they started to shift to solid tumors. However, in certain solid tumors, CD28 co-receptor TCRZ to work better. And it turns out that one of the major differences between these two constructs that only differ by the co-receptor is 41 bb stimulates a much more aerobic uh, program that leads to characteristics of persistence in central memory, as I showed in the Erica example and, um, and also the Madu example, whereas CD28 drives a more glycolytic programming that is more consistent with the factor function. 
And so it's not that you need one or the other. It really probably depends on how the patient is presenting. We now appreciate that almost all cancer patients are making some type of immune response that somehow gets paralyzed. And if we knew exactly where that compromising condition was, we could go in with the right supportive approach. And in this case, you could see how this could be one of the strategies that you might add uh, to a CAR T cell strategy. And Greg Del Goff followed up. He did a lot of work showing that aerobic metabolism, which makes a lot of sense to a bioenergetics, is, is a very um, uh, robust system to work in a hostile tumor environment. Aerobic metabolism allows cells to uh, derive um, uh, energy and biosynthetic precursors from multiple nutrients. So it, it's really good in a nutrient-deprived um, environment, as well as providing resistance to stress and oxidative stress and things like this. And so Greg um, asked the question in this study, if I simply increased uh, aerobic metabolism using therapeutic antibodies in clinical trials, um, could that somehow improve the patient's um, um, uh, responsiveness and persistence um, uh, and, and, and help further protect them or let's say um, um, uh, support the immune response? So here is anti-CD28 and 4-MBB. Here you're looking at just a 24-hour in vitro stimulation of CD8 cells, and you can clearly see 4-MBB, which is consistent with all the, the data I showed you, um, provides a much more aerobic uh, phenotype in these CD8 T cells. If you then do the next level of experiment, which again is a proof of concept of how a dosing regime might improve this metabolic poise of aerobic metabolism, here you're looking at three-day in vivo treated and sorted CD8 lymph node T cells. So three days treat with these various antibodies and see what the metabolic poise was of the CD8 T cells from these animals. And you can see that 4-1-BB was superior in raising the aerobic meta uh, stat, uh, metabolism uh, in these cells. And then he did the next experiment, which was a proof of concept uh, kind of therapeutic uh, regime. So uh, once a week for five weeks, injected animals with either a control isotype or anti-PD-1, which is obviously uh, known to be um, helpful and has data shown that it does increase aerobic metabolism at some level. Anti-PD-1 plus 4-1-BB. Um, 4-1-BB has been shown to be toxic in certain studies. Uh, so they did the last regime, which was once a day for three days before 1BB, followed up by PD-1. And as you can see here, that last treatment was extremely effective uh, in reducing tumor burden, again, showing that proof of concept. The last thing I want to show you here is um, some most recent unpublished data from the Carl June Lab, um, um, a very appreciative of Roddy O'Connor, who did the work uh, in that program, a um, uh, professor in the program in that group. And, and what you can see here is there has been some recent um, uh, uh, papers that have shown that higher doses of arginine in, uh, uh, in, um, in cell culture can increase mitochondrial um, respiration. And so they asked the question, since when we engineer T cells, we then expand them before returning to the patient in an autologous approach, could we actually engineer some desirable attributes such as persistence by increasing mitochondrial respiration during that expansion process? One of the things that the CAR T cells have been very unsuccessful uh, up to, to now is in targeting solid tumors. So this is a solid tumor model, a prostate uh, tumor model, targeting a prostate um, uh, antigen. And you can see here that if you culture these cells in 4 millimolar L-arginine, high doses versus the normal, you can see a much uh, significant increase in this in vivo model in term, I'm sorry, decrease in tumor burden uh, in this particular in vitro, in vivo uh, solid tumor model. And uh, if you look at what's going on by looking at the respiration using the seahorse and the OCAR, you can see that um, you can treat for seven days and then what they did here at day 15, they washed out the arginine at day seven. So you're looking at an additional eight days without arginine, but you can see it maintained this increased aerobic um, uh, metabolic uh, poise, which, you know, based on the previous work, might be a way to improve persistence uh, when returned uh, to, the, to the individual. So in summary, what we've learned is that 
the bioenergetic state, the contribution of both aerobic, mitochondrial, and glycolytic pathways have a very qualitative nature in supporting the appropriate state or cell fate as well as the functionality. And that we can actually follow the transition between these equilibriums by monitoring the rate at which, for example, glycolysis can increase uh, during proliferation and activation. And we see that these cells have very different states. When the immune system is working correctly, um, that's why most of us are very healthy. Um, we're repelling infectious and pathogenic processes continually. Uh, however, one could argue that we only experience chronic viral or chronic disease such as cancer when something has compromised the immune system in some way. And what we've learned very recently is one of the ways to do that is simply to prematurely reduce mitochondrial activity. And this leads to an actual exhaustive phenotype. And these exhaustive cells, although not dead, are non-functioning. And there's some early reports where you can actually turn them back on in some of the CAR T studies where they've retrieved uh, in relapsing patients some of these CAR T cells. We now can appreciate from recent studies that one possible way to um, essentially um, make um, the cells uh, condition them to be more resistant in those hostile environments is by increasing by various means uh, mitochondrial activity, whether it be through constructs or some type of media conditioning. Before I move on to the Nova site uh, in the SURE guide that I'll spend a couple minutes with, I just want to share with you um, that we have a new product out that's being released, uh, just released, and that is the a new Seahorse um, uh, next generation platform to replace the XFP Mini, our smaller system that runs more precious dedicated samples, and we're calling it the HS for high sensitivity Mini. Uh, and what's different about this new instrument from uh, the instrument that you know, the XFP. Well, first of all, uh, we've dramatically improved its ability to resolve small differences in respiring cells. And that's extremely important for people doing immunology work or work with cells that are in a resting state because their energetic status tends to be lower. Also, we've really designed this uh, for workflows using suspension cells, which again, to help out individuals, especially in immunology. And so it we believe it really expands uh, the kinds of things you can do and increases the types of experiments that were uh, somewhat out of reach before uh, this new tool. Here's uh, real quick what the data looks like. What really where the cell matters is in these lower uh, respiration ranges where it's harder to see significant differences between cell types. You can look here at the standard deviation rates on the same exact cells being run on the XFP versus the XF mini, you can see how dramatically uh, improved the data quality is because we can now discriminate uh, with higher confidence at lower rates. Another great um, uh, attribute of this new system is we went to the cloud, we fully enabled our analytics that now are accessible in the cloud. This is the first fully enabled uh, a cloud-enabled platform, and all platforms that we generate going forward will be fully cloud-enabled. And I, I don't have to explain what that means to the younger people in our audience. Um, that gives you full accessibility, collaborative potential, moving information around, accessing what you need, when you need, and where you want to do it. So we believe this is really going to you know, set our customers free and enable people to be much more flexible uh, and to be much more directive in the work that they're doing. Um, it's just an example of some of the kits that are coming out. This is our new T-cell activation kit designed for human cells. We provide everything necessary, the assay kit with all the reagents. We have PDL coded plates. This is what's going to dramatically improve the quality of adhering suspension cells in a very relevant state for doing this kind of work and opening up this early window of detection. You can see here how amazingly um, robust the data is and you can barely see the uh, standard deviation bars uh, here, especially on the CD4 versus CD8 T cells. You're looking at activation as a measure of proton efflux rate, which is our measure of uh, glycolysis. The last thing I'll leave you with before my last two topics uh, is an actual preview. Uh, this product has not launched yet, but we're so confident of the timeline and where we stand that we are quite confident by the end of this year, we'll have it available to you. And by simply altering the uh, consumable, the uh, HS mini plate, 
we can increase dramatically the signal that you're getting from our biosensors. And what this does is allow you to use fewer cells, something that we know many of our customers are asking us about, especially when you're dealing with sorted cells or let's say infiltrating lymphocytes, cells that are hard to get a hold of that you're never gonna fill up a 96 well plate with. Now we have a solution. Here's what uh, a low cell number count would look like in a normal plate done on an XFP. Here's what it looks like done in this new ring well plate. And I think you can agree with me that that's a very significant improvement uh, in the ability to discriminate differences uh, with fewer cells. So we're very excited about this uh, and can't wait to get this out to uh, you all. So let's change gears for the last two um, uh, that I wanna talk about, and that is now um, flow cytometry. Uh, it's incredibly um, useful and a very popular tool, especially among immunologists. Uh, and so what's different about the Novocyte uh, Quantian line that we have uh, through our acquisition of ACA? Um, it's bringing the latest and best of uh, performance, number of colors, and really robust uh, activity to the bench top. So these cytometers bring a capability that you normally have to go to a core or you need someone that's pretty well trained, if not highly trained, to do this work to the bench top, where really it now becomes a common tool, a democratized tool that pretty much anyone in the lab can use. It's won several awards for the fact that it's so easy to set up. It's almost essentially automatic shutdown, things that make it really easy to move from one user to the next. But it brings all the power of new silicon-based um, photo detectors. Um, that really provide extreme sensitivity and the ability to really discriminate colors without making manual adjustments or other things that qu require quite a bit of knowledge to do. Uh, so we're very excited about this uh, particular tool. It blends very well with the other real-time analysis tools in terms of characterization. Here's just a very simple example, looking at a CD19 panel for a CAR T cell. You can see here that you have a number of different subsets and different markers, differentiation activation markers that can be um, uh, interrogated. But what's really cool is it can run both beads and cells. So you can look at bulk cytokines, you can look at intracellular staining. So it really expands the type of, of, of um, a panel and analysis you can do. As we all now appreciate, cytokine storm has become a, a real big deal, something that's probably always been there we just never appreciated until immunotherapy and now with COVID and infectious disease. This is becoming a, a key thing we need to understand better in immunology and being able to look at both cytokines and immune subsets at the same time is gonna really be extremely helpful in doing this. And we believe that this particular uh, platform is ideally uh, designed uh, to do this. We also are gonna be looking at combining it with our other cell analysis platforms so you can get the best of both worlds. In this case, you have an Excelligence to give you this nice kinetic readout of the biology in combination with being able to, in this case, sample the media at various time points, run on the novocyte to assess all the different soluble factors such as cytokines, uh, granzyme, and other uh, mediators of cytotoxicity. And with that, this brings us to our last uh, uh, tool and solution that we wanna share with you. Uh, again, uh, gene editing needs no introduction. Uh, and I know that many of you are probably using this tool. And, and using uh, and gene editing in the laboratory is definitely a very tractable and very useful, and it's, it's obviously improving every day. But as you move downstream uh, into drug discovery and into clinical uses, such as engineering cells, uh, some of the earlier work has, has just begun to happen, the efficiency and the accuracy uh, is not anywhere near where we need to be. So many people are working on ways to improve um, uh, the overall fidelity uh, and, uh, and um, accuracy of this approach. And many of you may not know, I had no idea before I joined Agilent, that uh, through, the, um, through a number of acquisitions, um, they uh, have now have, and through the manufacturing development, we were actually a world leader, not just in producing DNA uh, and RNA oligos and, and synthesis, but actually the quality, and we produce the longest and highest fidelity, both DNA and RNA oligos. Why is that, and how, how are we able to do that? We use a chemical synthesis process to do that, and it's highly robust. 
So if few of you may know that Agilent came from Hewlett Packard many, many years ago, uh, and they know how to print really well. And we take advantage of that kind of printing technology with chemical synthesis to allow us to generate um, what are arguably, we can get up to 160 tumors with dramatically high purity, um, which really Im improves stability and, and activity and targeting of various different uh, guide RNAs. But that isn't really the, the big deal. The big deal is the ability to modify these uh, chemical entities that we're using um, as the various base pairs. And by uh, chemically modifying, we can dramatically improve not just stability, but actually specificity. So we can really begin now to um, uh, work away at improving both the efficiency uh, and accuracy of doing gene editing. Here's an example of what that looks like. A couple of publications on the left, looking at improvements in stability. MS and MSP are these chemical modifications. Uh, and on the right, looking at reducing off-target uh, edits, uh, shown in yellow, again, by various uh, um, modifications uh, to the actual base pairs themselves. We provide all the way from research to GMP large-scale production. So for those people doing translational work, you don't have to switch um, um, the source, uh, and you can ride the entire way with uh, the type of uh, guide you need at the right configuration for wherever your work demands it to be. And so with that, I appreciate your attention today. Uh, I hope that um, this has helped maybe tie together uh, some of the work that you've seen from some of the various presenters today it was no accident that many of them use these tools uh, in their laboratories. And uh, again, just to really focus down and let you know that we're, we believe we need tools to play with all the things in your toolbox, but ones that can really allow you to dive deeper into the biology, to get a richer and a more relevant, so you don't have to do as many experiments. So you can really be more confident that what you're uh, uh, looking at in your conclusions is likely to translate further downstream. Uh, and so this is what we've been focused on. Everything I shared with you today is actually in a single electronic book that we developed uh, uh, last year that has all the links and ways to just have a very simple short read um, that goes over a lot of the material. If you just search in Google for Agile Breakthroughs in Immunotherapy, it gets you right there. You can download that book, and it can send you in any number of directions, depending on uh, what you'd like to know. It also has a lot of references and authors and your colleagues on there and how they are, um, in many cases, they are driving the field forward on uh, utilizing these tools and ways to help them uh, do that type of work. So with that, I uh, appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you, David. I will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you do have a question you'd like to ask, uh, please do submit it. Uh, we'll be able to get to most of the questions before the end of the hour. Um, however, even if we don't uh, make it to your question, we'll be forwarding it to David and the Agilent team and we'll be following up with you. So um, let's get started. So the first question, David, that we got was, um, why is it that T cells are increasing their glycolysis due to the fact that that's a less efficient energetic pathway to obtain that energy rather than um, relying on the mitochondrial respiration post-activation? Yeah, it's a great question. And even though we have some what I would uh, call kind of um, didactic or some simple responses that are somewhat generalizable, there's still a lot we don't know. But the, the very simple straightforward is that um, a glycolytic um, glycolysis is something that happens in the cytosol that's not nearly as organized as an organelle where the mitochondria resides. And because of this, glycolysis has the ability to turn on immediately and respond to immediate demands, biosynthetic, energetic, and redox in a way that, that mitochondria is not uh, similarly capable of doing. And so, you know, a very simple analogy would be that when everybody runs, no matter how in shape you are, you don't start out aerobically. You start out glycolytically. That's where the lactic acid comes from, especially if you're sprinting. But we know in order to sustain a high level of demand, we need that mitochondrial system 
to kick in. Now, that was an oversimplification. There are many more uh, nuances associated with there are things that both systems do that are somewhat overlapping and can clearly compensate, but there are many things that they seem to be uniquely enabled to do. So, for example, we now know that certain cytokines are connected to glycolytic enzymes in terms of their regulation at the protein level. So there has been an evolutionary rationale for connecting some of the intermediates of metabolism as a succinate and fumarate for things like inflammation uh, in ways. And so I think the best way that we tend to understand and think about it is, again, our pathways, our transcription factors, the various pathways, the, um, the SARCs, the mix, the P53s, they actually don't do any work. They tell others to do work. The actual work in the cell is these metabolites and these pathways that either form energy or biosynthetic molecules. So it makes sense that no matter where you are upstream and no matter what type, so to look at 41BB as a great example. How does 41BB play out its effect? It's uh, one of the outcomes of it is a clear in increase in mitochondrial respiration. That's how it physically mediates uh, the effects of methylation, demethylation, and other pathways. So hopefully that provides some color for this. But again, please, um, we have some simple um, 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 correlations and maybe a little more than simple, but there's still quite a bit that we don't understand. And now that we have better tools, I think every day we're seeing more and more. And now Deep Chandel's lecture that he gave, I think a couple lectures before this, it's a perfect example of what we know and what we don't know and how we can start to get to those answers. So I'd really recommend that uh, viewing that one amongst uh, Ping Chi Ho, Hong Bo Chi, and some of the others that uh, really are driving into this uh, this understanding. Thanks, David. The um, next question that came in was again about T cell persistence, and within our technology profile, can you portfolio rather can you predict T cell persistence, knowing the bioenergetic profile of T cells um, and uh, the the um, person that asked the question also asked, you know, we'd like to hear your comments on what you think in terms of modifying some metabolic genes to promote mitochondrial activity in an adoptive cell therapy setting. Yeah, that's a, a great question. question. Great question. There's a lot of work going on, as you might imagine. Not all of that's being made public. There are a lot of companies that are. Um, we know that cell therapy is the newest modality. It's a living drug. It's so different from the other modalities um, that we're just now learning how, what are the quality attributes that are needed and how to design those attributes into that particular product. I showed you an example where you can hardwire it. In the case of 4 MBB or C28, it's more of a hardwire. Uh, and then I showed you a case with uh, increased arginine, how you could um, condition it. Uh, for example. Um, so the first thing, persistence associated with mitochondrial activity is pretty straightforward. Decades of understanding of mitochondria, it's the quintessential element of viability. It's probably the most direct measure of cell health that one can make. And we're just now beginning to learn how to derive those nuances. So, so that's pretty logical and straightforward. But your question about how best to um, adapt to a situation where the pathology is in, in a consequence of some interruption uh, of what would otherwise be a normal um, uh, phenotype uh, for the cells. So on one hand, hardwiring it, let's say through a, a car construct, maybe that could have some adverse effects, right? Um, you know, leading to some of the adverse effects we see because if the cells uh, don't uh, become quiescent after their um, taking over the pathological process, could you have some immunopathology associated with that? So that's one of one of the concerns. In fact, some companies are thinking of suicide switches that they're kind of engineering. Others are looking at orthogonal types of cytokines they can engineer so that only the, the cytokine they supply to the patient will only specifically uh, affect the immune cells, kind of a way to try to separate from the cytokine adverse effect that is being seen in a lot of situations. So I think the field right now is extremely open in terms of how one would do it. I think the, um, we, we know uh, there's a lot of correlative. So a couple companies have actually looked at the ratio. Uh, I, I have to be careful what I say here, but, but um, there have been some studies where they, as you know, um, they freeze down um, the, the CAR-T um, 
products they have. And then after nine, 12 months, they know um, from the patient data who were complete responders, partial non-responders. And they've actually gone back and retrospectively, they thaw out those and they run metabolic analysis. And there are some data that is correlating with this increased aerobic um, uh, poise uh, leading to more complete responses. So they're, they're, they're in the early stages. I'd say it's a little bit beyond proof of concept, but it, I wouldn't say it's been an established um, standard by which people can begin to um, uh, qualify, right, um, these various processes. Yeah, that's an interesting comment that you made about the balancing act of controlling those two major energy producing pathways. I tend to think of it as a, as a see seesaw um, right. and effect one and the other one gets affected and figuring out similar to the combinatorial approaches with many drug discovery programs that that comes into play at the cellular level with these cellular based therapies as well. That's right. Uh, Ned. And in fact, um, I, I assume our audience can maybe still see the slides. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, I just pulled it up. But in that slide that I showed you where we kind of graphed out um, the cell types, um, there's actually some evidence now that the cells um, oscillate. So let's see if it comes up in this. Now, I, I didn't put it in here, but, but to your point, um, in a normal immune response, you may be oscillating between exhaustion uh, and persistence um, that is being titrated by the presence of the pathological process. And so it's a dynamic interplay. It's not like um, the immune system with all the many cells knows exactly what level of, um, um, you know, exhaustive of turning off and turning down. You know, it's constantly probably tweaking the immune response in, in, in reaction to how the pathogen is uh, trying to evade um, mm -hmm. immune surveillance, right? So it's a dynamic process. So your point Ned, about this cycling is important. See, the thing we need to remember about metabolism, which is different than how we study a lot of our pathways and a lot of other um, types of, um, you know, omics and, and, and say flow, is metabolism is always in an equilibrium. So it's always moving between equilibriums or trying to stay within an equilibrium. So if you think about how metabolism is helping the immune system oscillate to find that optimal poise to, to not to overcome pathogen, but not too much, so it causes immune pathology, but just enough to bring the pathogen down until it's overcome, and then quiet the whole system down to wait for the next re reappearance. So you begin to look at it in that way, it starts to become tractable, and it even more reinforces the idea that we need kinetic tools. Because how do you begin to model this kind of cycling of back and forth between the host and the pathogen if you don't have those kind of tools, right? Uh, so that's that's part of the reason that we've been so focused on this approach. Yeah, and missing missing those important windows with live cell analysis becomes more critical in that experimental yeah. need. Um, okay, well, I think we've got time for one more question, even though we have more. And again, we will follow up um, to answer these after the fact. Um, yeah, here's one. So. How many, can you give us an example of how many T cells are needed to run an XF assay? Um, and, and what, you know, some of the advantages are compared sure. with like, measuring mitochondrial mass on a flow cytometry, for example? Sure. Well, it's um, for flow cytometry, did they ask, or for uh, XF? Yeah, they said what advantages, what advantages compared to measuring mitochondrial mass as an example, as a comparative example by flow cytometry? Ah, ah, very good, very good. So clearly, uh, flow is very advantageous in that you get a single cell as well as a population very quickly. That's a great thing. So you get some idea of um, the spatial resolution, right? Uh, whereas the XF technology right now is measuring that bulk population, right? You currently can't do those kinds of assessments at a single cell level. Uh, so to your question, the, um, um, again, Greg Delgoff, who I mentioned, uh, and, and, and please look him up, um, they have started to validate some uh, reagents that would be amenable to flow that would give you an idea of relative mitochondrial mass. Now, it won't give you a rate, it won't give you that quantitative, but if you now combine, which he does, if you look at his papers, the one I showed in the presentation, he does um, XF uh, rate analysis to really understand the phenotype and the quantifiable phenotype that exists. And then he uses flow 
to do more of a qualitative analysis and very beautiful work where you can show very nicely that immune cells entering the tumor microenvironment have an appropriate level of mitochondrial mass. He uses this, um, this mitre tracker FM uh, reagent to do it. It's in his paper. Uh, and then once it enters the microenvironment, it's the environment that really uh, shuts down the respiration. You can see very nicely by flow. Um, it's, it's not quantitative, but it follows a very nice qualitative change. And then he uses the XF to do that. Now we are working hard, and, and as you saw with the XF, so numbers of cells. So you know the numbers of cells you need for flow are now are very few, a few thousand. You can do pretty much what you want unless you're looking at rare cells. On a normal XF experiment, if it's a cell line, you're in the you know, 30, 50,000 range. If you're in primaries, especially immune cells, you're probably somewhere between 250,000 to 500,000. I think most people are getting more down to 250 or so. In that ring well I showed you on the HS Mini, that could get you down to that 50 to 100,000 um, cell per well range, which would dramatically open up experiments like tills and things that are really out of reach, or you got to be going through a lot of mice uh, to get there. So hopefully that gives you some um, uh, sense or range of, of what we're talking about in terms of cells. And that again comes back to the reason we have an HS mini versus a 96. So we know there's some experiments that will never fill up a 96 well. And because you have this kinetic data and can do injections, you can generate a lot of rich information from a single experiment. So a lot of people don't need as many groups. They don't need to run uh, a full 96 well plate, even if they have sufficient cell numbers to get the kind of quality data they need. And that's what we found that both have a place uh, in the lab. In fact, many of the labs that do a lot of this um, have access to both because there are times when one uh, is the right format and there are times when the other is. All right, well, thank you um, <clears throat> again, David, for sharing this state-of-the-art interconnected tool bench and our cell analysis vision engineered to support the exploding needs of this really fast-growing market. Um, and special thanks to all of the audience for supplying the questions and your participation today. Um, and so with that, we thank both the audience and David and enjoy the rest of our talks today. Great. Thank you all.